Good afternoon, viewers and listeners to the British Business Podcast Series. We're in Mayfair. I'm delighted to welcome Paul Gardner, CEO of the Mantis Collection. And we're in for a treat this afternoon because I've just been talking to Paul for about five minutes. The content is um, long, lengthy, but so interesting. Welcome, Paul. Thanks for coming in today. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come talk to you and uh, your listeners too. Thank you so much. So I'd like to start at the beginning and you and your journey and how you've got to here and then all the bits in the middle of how you were in business and what you did. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I'll start r- right back in uh, when I was probably a 13 year old and um, at boarding school in South Africa, uh, apartheid was rife. So South Africa was in, in a, a, a very difficult uh, time and, um, and I'd grown up, uh, you know, with this crazy father who was a, a, a an entrepreneur of note you know yeah, he bought kfc into our region in south africa he, wow. uh, he you know he was one of the first to to engage with motorola and do the page boy systems long before cell phones um, and then got involved in construction and road building and then ultimately thoroughbred horse racing so it was like wow <laughs> and uh, as a young 13 year old you know, there's a podcast like, of every and, single one of those yeah, absolutely is you got the wrong guy here <laughs> Um, so then what happened was uh, he got out of racing and um, was very keen, like most South Africans, to own a patch of Africa. You know, you want to have a, a game reserve with wild animals. And he we went out on a mission to find that. And um, he looked at far field at Zimbabwe. He was originally from Zimbabwe, so he, he thought that was a place to do it. But now we were living as a family in Port Elizabeth, which is right down in the south of South Africa. So to manage a game reserve up there would just be ludicrous. You know, that's a, a long way away. And so he found something close by and he found it between the city that my parents were in, which is Port Elizabeth, and the city where my brother and I were at boarding school, which was Grahamstown. And it was equidistant. So it was about an hour each way. And there he he settled on buying this uh, thousand hectare uh, piece of land. And he said, right, we've got this little farm. There's a few antelope on it. And this will be our place to meet on weekends. So it looked fantastic. And uh, and he had just got a nice check from selling his, um, his thoroughbred stud farm. So we were a happy family. And then uh, the farm next door came up for sale and he snapped that up. And then the next one came up for sale. And before he knew it, he had 10,000 hectares. And uh, with nothing, it was sheep, goats and cattle. And he thought, what the hell am I going to do with this now? (laughs) But the farms are going for nothing. You could buy a farm for 20 pounds a hectare, which is just ridiculous. And um, then the penny dropped. He started researching um, what wildlife had existed there 200 years prior. And believe it or not, he got access to the settler, the British settler history um, and the settlers that had settled there in 1820. So if you go back to the early 1800s, there was the Napoleonic Wars and then there was this huge socioeconomic crisis across Europe. And how the Brits dealt with that was they decided to send 6,000 people down to the Eastern Cape because they obviously had a territory down in South Africa. Yeah. And they said, you're going to go and settle there and, and farm there. And 6,000 people put their hands up and they were put on ships and they sailed all the way down to this uh, to Port Elizabeth. It was then called Old Goa Bay. They were each given um, ox wagons and, and, and a head of cattle. And they were told to go and find their farm and go and settle the land. And so they would document in their great big Bibles that they carried with them on those ox wagons all the wildlife that they saw in their diaries. And uh, so some wise fellow, fast forward 200 years, got hold of all those manuscripts and published a book on the encounters of these British settlers. And uh, that was the blueprint for what my father was going to go and do. He started reading up about all this wildlife and he started to bring back what he had read up about 200 years prior. So it was a fascinating time. So the first animals to arrive on this 10,000 hectare reserve were uh, elephants, five baby elephants. And then um, some rhino and uh, hippo back in the river and then the giraffe. And, you know, I was, a, as I said, a 13-year-old growing up with this. I mean, what more could I ask for? My wow. brother and I was just lapping this up. And what we was this maverick what? father. What, what year was that? That would have been 1989, 1990, 91, 92. Okay. The building of this game reserve. And uh, its name became Shamwari, which is uh, a Shona word, a Zimbabwean word, which means my friend. Okay. So dad had taken that name from Zimbabwe and, and established this reserve. And it, 
Of course, we were coming out of apartheid, as I rightly mentioned to you, and uh, the country was on the brink of a civil war, and Dad had spent every penny he had made on, the, on this stud farm he had sold on this game reserve now to try and turn it into a game reserve, yeah. a successful game reserve. Sure. But, um, you know, it, 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 there was zero tourism in South Africa uh, because, you know, nobody wanted to set foot in this uh, apartheid country that was on the brink of a war. And then, of course, uh, he almost lost everything. I mean, he was ready to throw in the towel. My brother and I were almost pulled out of this very expensive boarding school. And uh, it's amazing how many entrepreneurs have, have that statement said about their life. Yeah, I nearly yeah. lost it all. And it's, I think it's part of the entrepreneurial DNA. That's 100%. They're prepared to yeah. lose everything because they probably are confident enough to, to get it all back again. If you don't have that DNA, don't 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 venture down that street. I mean, I don't I don't prize myself in having that DNA. Dad, Dad's unique, and they, and I've come across a lot of these people that you know they lose everything, but they build it up again. They they um, they're not gun shy. They just go for it. So no, so yeah, so ninety two roll around ninety three. We had the first elections, or ninety four, I think it was, and then still there was very little tourism. Shamwari was hemorrhaging. And then we had this miracle moment. 1995 comes along. South Africa's awarded the 1995 Rugby World Cup. Wow. And Nelson's around the corner and he's there and he adorns the Springbok rugby jersey and he sort of brings this uh, Afrikaans and this African together through sport. And it's this beautiful moment and it's turned into a movie Invictus. Yep. Hollywood couldn't have scripted it better. <laughs> it's a real goosebump bump moment. And the world was watching. Yeah. South Africa pull off this international event and we did it successfully. And the, the cherry on the top was obviously South Africa winning the tournament. Yes. And then the floodgates to tourism opened and we never looked back. I mean, the uh, you know, this game reserve was the closest game reserve to Cape Town. Nice big box tick. Uh, Dad coined the phrase, the malaria-free safari. Because <laughs> typically you have to take those terrible yeah. uh, drugs to fight off a malaria. And suddenly we, we established a game reserve in a malaria-free area. Then he had got a phone call from the uh, actress Virginia McKenna of Born Free, the movie, saying, listen, she's got some animals that she'd like to rehome, some lions, a pair of lions. Can, can we take them? And we said, yeah, and we created a sanctuary for these lions. And, uh, you know, the PR that came with that. Wow. I mean, live television crossings, Hello Magazine with celebrities. It was just like, wow. Before social media, you had to rely on other means. And that's how we did it. Dad was an absolute guru and a mastermind at PR. And so he put this place on the map. And um, it was tough for him. He had a lot of people laugh at him when he was bringing back the first elephants. All those farmers that surrounded him said, geez, who's this joker bringing back these elephants? And, um, uh, you know, he, he managed to get some big endorsements from people like the late Dr. Ian Player. Uh, you know, he was like the Attenborough of South Africa. Okay. And Dad will often tell you, the biggest thing in, in building a business is to get endorsements. Um, it, it, it really helps you along. And... Uh, um, and, and, and so that belief in those big people in conservation really helped us turn the ship around too. Um, and, and as I said, the rest is history. Shamwari became what it is today. Um, it's a, it now a 25,000 hectare reserve, uh, 10,000 animals roaming free. 10,000 animals. Yeah, we, we eventually bought the, the lions back and they are re free roaming. We did that in 2000. When the last lion was shot out in 1863. So for dad to bring that back was just uh, amazing. So, so that was kind of the, the path that I was on was now in hospitality and conservation. I finished school and I went to study marketing and, and kind of got into, into this field, into the hospitality space. So, so did, is, was that a choice of yours or did dad say, you need to go and get educated and you need to get some kind of yeah. learning? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think if I could have left school and gone straight into business with that, I would have preferred that because I wasn't an academic. I okay. really, really struggled. Um, but yet he insisted. He said, go, go and do that university thing or whatever you choose to do because it's an important stepping stone in life. Sure. Whether or not you learn anything, you can stuff it all up. Yep. But just go and build those networks and friendships and learn how to just deal with life. So it, it was something I took on board, probably more the party side than the academic <laughs> side. I, I got chucked out at university. I didn't last there long. And then I went to a technical type college and, and did my marketing. And then, and then I, 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 I messed around a bit. I, I, I actually ended up becoming a game ranger on the game reserve, which wasn't a bad thing. You yeah. know, it was learning about the guest and, and, and being able to communicate 
um, with these clients who are paying a lot of money to come from the UK to stay and, and enjoy a safari at the game reserve. So it was good. So was it preliminary, um, primarily UK? Yes, people. hugely. Is that hugely because UK. of the marketing you did, or just? I think so. I think the born free piece played a big role. Um, uh, uh, the British like self drive in South Africa. They like to hire a car and go and explore. They're quite sure. adventurous. Yep. Remember, in South Africa, you also drive on the same side of the road as you do here. <laughs> yeah. So the Americans, they like to charter little planes and fly all over the place and go right up into Botswana. The British are brave and they do this garden route, which linked Cape Town to Port Elizabeth and ultimately the game reserve. So um, that played into our favor. So we, we uh, and a lot easier to market to Brits because okay. so there's, so, there's such a tight relationship between South Africa and Britain. Mm. So that all fell into our hands nicely. And that's kind of where I started cutting my teeth. I got involved okay. in the marketing of this game reserve. And then what we did was, um, off the back of the success of Shamwari, we um, established and developed other game reserves. Um, we had the blueprint now, so we know how to do sure. it. And and rewilding became a bigger part of, of our journey. Um, and we took on a project called Sunborna, which is uh, the size of Singapore as a game reserve. And we rewilded that. And that was even closer to Cape Town. Uh, we, we bought a, a couple of other hotels. And then we had inquiries from other people saying, can you manage our properties? And that was quite interesting because now we're earning fees. We... We don't have the risk, but sure. we, we're looking after your property on your behalf. So there was a management uh, play there. And, and in 2000, it was time to actually come up with an umbrella brand name for the group. And so, again, Dad consulted uh, Dr. Ian Player, who I mentioned to you before, oh. the, the guy that gave us all the endorsements. And he came up with a clever name. And it's named after the mantis, uh, praying mantis, the, the little insect. Sure. And the prey mantis is an interesting one because uh, it's one insect that you find on six of the seven continents. Um, so it's everywhere. And um, we came up with the most beautiful acronym for this little insect, which is man and nature together is sustainable. And so we live by that as a hotel group yeah. today. And we called the mantis collection today as a result of that, that little uh, journey, the building of Shamwari, acquiring these other assets and then putting this name on top of it. And so today we try and live by that. We take, we've taken that DNA, that Shamwari DNA, and we try and roll it out wherever we go to on this planet. Um, and the idea is to take Mantis to all seven continents. Right now, we're on Africa, obviously. Um, we're born of Africa. Uh, we have a great relationship with the, the most beautiful um, lodge called White Desert. Believe it or not, that's on Antarctica. And it's the only one of its kind. Wow. Um, so you would fly from Cape Town to Antarctica. It's a five-hour flight. It's very close. You land on an ice airstrip, and it is the most surreal experience you've ever been on. It's, it, for me, it, it, the closest thing I can relate it to is probably going to the moon. It, wow. is, it, it is so foreign to, to us as humans. And I was one of the very f a few privileged people to have gone there. And I was there in November now, and um, we spent a week there. And it was just as Omicron had been announced in South Africa. Remember the the, one, the strain? The, strain yeah. the world just went in, back into lockdown. Yes. And we thought, oh, God. And we were leaving at 6 the, the following morning. And we, we got to Antarctica, thank goodness. And it was so nice not to have internet or anything out there. Just sure. escape and go and spend this magnificent time on, on um, the seventh continent. And, I mean, it's sparse. It is this, they, they, the camp's called White Desert for a reason because you're actually entering a desert. Nothing grows there, obviously. Sure. It is just one gigantic glacier that the camp is built on. And, uh, and then you take a, a, a smaller charter flight and you go and experience the penguins, oh. and the, you know, the emperor penguin colony. Are there something like 34 different colonies around the whole continent. And, and we went to see one of those. Loved that experience. I'm a runner. I love my long distance running. Okay. They said, you're not allowed to run here because there are crevices everywhere. The only place you can run is on the th three kilometer long airstrip. So I said, right, I'm going. I put my shorts and t-shirt on thinking I'd be fine. And then a, a bit of a blizzard came up. Just a, <laughs> just a breath of air. And you feel that. I the hell I was colder. <laughs> so I laid up on my next run. But I did it. I did my 15 Ks each morning. And uh, this beautiful... Um, uh, the food there is spectacular. The camp is amazing and very memorable. So we have an association with that camp. Um, but we're also in other parts of Africa today. We, we've got a, a, a small collection of boats called the Zambezi Queen Collection. And they sail on the Chobe River, which ultimately becomes the Zambezi. 
And um, that's one of our biggest producing um, products today, uh, river cruising, the river cruise market, because you don't just cruise around looking at uh, beautiful buildings down a river. This is in the wilds of Africa. Your closest attraction is the hippo a meter away from your bedroom. In the water. Yeah, exactly. And the crocodiles are everywhere and, and, uh, and, and the elephants and the buffalo and everybody come, all these animals come down to drink. So it's a, we call it a water safari. It's very different to a land-based safari where you're bouncing around in a, in a, a Land Rover with no roof. Um, this is a phenomenal way to do it. So we're on quite an interesting journey with the, with the boats because we are now looking um, at the, uh, the waterways across Africa. If you think about it, Lake Victoria, is the size of most countries. Sure. Uh, Lake Tanganyika, um, there's Lake Kivu, uh, which links, um, which is in Rwanda. And so we're busy with a, a product there. I'm not going to talk too much about it because um, it hasn't come out the starting blocks yet. It's been built. But the idea is you'd go and do the chimpanzees in the south of Rwanda, and then you hop on this uh, river cruise boat for two nights and ex uh, you know experience pure mantis luxury on this river cruise boat. And then you, you stop in the north, disembark, and about 45 minutes away is the Volcanoes National Park, and you go and do the gorilla experience. Oh, wow. Yeah, so what a way to do it. So we, we're all about linking up these beautiful experiences across Africa and then across the world. So we have quite an interesting journey now in the Middle East now too. Um, we're looking at expanding the brand into the Middle East, and we've had a lot of approaches um, for us to come there because they like the, the fact that we have this unique uh, conservation DNA. They like the fact that we have uh, a very unique guest experience. And so um, my next trip is to Bahrain next week where we are um, involved with the construction of a hotel on an island off the coast of Bahrain and it's for the ruler. And the ruler's office said they want Mantis there, again, for reasons I've just explained. Um, we want this to be a nice green hotel um, and we don't want the guests just lying on the beach. Okay. We, we want the guests in the sea, yeah. replanting coral reefs. Fantastic. You know, and, and we want to bring edutainment to this resort. So edutainment for me is, you know, we want to entertain the guests, but we want to educate you at the same time. So okay. when you get back on your plane to the UK, you've actually learned something, whether it's you or your kids. So, I mean, the kids will get a kick out of putting goggles and Absolutely. snorkels on and replanting coral. Um, uh, or going on a land-based safari, tracking the, the gazelle that they're trying to rehabilitate on the, on the island. Um, so uh, we, we're busy with quite a few interesting um, uh, developments there. And, and we spoke a little bit about IPs before we, yes. we, we got into this conversation. Um, on my journey in life um, is, uh, you know, dad spoke about endorsements and, and uh, engaging with these high profile people. And the one person I was quite keen to meet because now I was living here. I eventually moved over here to, and I moved here in 2002 to the UK to represent Shamwari and Mantis because as, I, as we said, most of our clients were coming out of the UK. So it made sense to be here. Somebody from our family had to be here. Sure. And I was the one that was bunted out of, out of the bush and brought here, <laughs> which is fine. I, I haven't looked back. I've loved the UK. And um, so, so representing Mantis, um, we also, set up a business called Worldwide Experience. And that was taking gap, kids on gap years from the UK to Africa to work behind the scenes on the game reserves with the vet and the wildlife guys and the ecologists and the anti-poaching units. So we developed a, a whole series of courses for kids on gap year to come out to Africa. And so I, I come back to that person that I wanted to meet. And that person, that celebrity I wanted to get to was Bear Grylls. Okay. You know, the adventurer yes. and the explorer and the very survivalist. Well, very well known here. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't know quite how to do that. You know, you can reach out and, sure. you know, through your network. Um, but, uh, and, and, and the reason I wanted to get to him was I wanted to start a survival academy in Africa where kids could go out and as opposed to just learning about wildlife and conservation, they could actually learn about survival in Africa. So eventually I met him. Uh, I got to Bear at a fundraiser and uh, we got chatting and, um, and I wanted to also get him involved in rhino conservation and all of that um, because I knew it could bring quite a lot of and add quite a lot of value to sure. saving our, our wildlife and being a voice for the wildlife. And, um, and then I, I messaged Bear and I said, we need to get together. I'm really keen to do this. So he said, yeah, let's do it. But we're not doing it in Africa only. We're going to take this thing around the world. I want you to take my survival brand 
um, around the world for me. Don't get involved in my television. I'm quite good at that. But what you can do is take what I do in TV and bring it to life for kids, bring it to life for adults, bring it to life for corporates, for corporate team building. And so we've been on a journey now together for 10 years. Wow. And, and we did it. And we were in China, we were in Australia, we were in um, Europe and Greece. Uh, we're talking to Croatia now. We're in, um, in Rasselheimer, which is one of the Emirates um, that make up the UAE. You said at the beginning that the goal and objective was to be in seven continents? Yes, yeah. yeah. So is that achieved? Well, that's really for Mantis, for the Bear Grylls Survival Academy, which is our the next venture of mine. We're almost there, yeah. We, okay. we, we, we just got to lock up America now. We're quite close to doing that. And then Antarctica, we can do stuff there too. So yes, so, I've achieved it with that okay. for the wow. Bear brand. The, 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 I'm guessing the wildlife yes. is such a, a, an intricate part of the whole experience. So did you see the um, wildlife um, organization come out with this statement last week about the 70% Yes, I did. Drop. How, how did you feel about that? It's frightening, but those stats need to be thrown at us all the time, more so than ever, sure. because that's the only way we're going to wake up. The sadness is, you know, and I've experienced it myself, you know, the rhino poaching in South Africa suddenly went through the roof in about 2007, eight, around there. It all kicked off, and it was because suddenly you had the Asian markets you know, you look at China. China is a, con a consumer. Vietnam is a consumer. Um, but they all went through this incredible wave of wealth. Now, bearing in mind that the rhino horn was consumed by a very wealthy um, Far Eastern person. And they believe that it's aspirational. It's like owning a Porsche or whatever else. Yeah. There's also medicinal uses yeah, that yeah, they yeah. look at using it for. There's multiple uses for it. Like shark fin. Exactly. Same thing. So it's almost something you'd gift somebody, yeah. if, you know, if yeah. you really wanted to impress them. And, uh, and that's fine. I respect that we've all got our things in culture, and I, we have to be respectful of that. Um, but they all suddenly became very wealthy in 2007, 8, 9. We know what happened in China. It just went through the oh, roof. Yeah. And so you had a, a middle class that was suddenly able to afford rhino horns. So the demand for it suddenly just went through the roof. And so um, if we saw this height now we were losing a thousand rhino a year in south africa at one point it got totally out of hand and and you'd see social media posts every day of rhinos faces just hacked off and blah 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 and then this hatred would grow for the far east and it was just awful um but then people start switching off to it because they become so fatigued with sure, seeing it every sure. single day and you're just like when you're scrolling now you think oh, i don't want to look at it anymore and unfortunately with the, the cl climate crisis that we're facing today, you're going to have the same thing. People are going to, because it, it's depressing. It yeah. just brings you down the whole yes. time. So we need, we need clever ways to, to get this message across. And it is through sharing these stats, but what is the solution? What are the good news stories that are going on out there? Because we only hear the bad news stories. Sure. Somebody's got to raise their hand and say, come guys, we've got to do this. We've got to actually um, start telling the story in a positive light um, and tell the good news stories and, Get, I mean, the youngsters are engaged um, and, uh, you know, they, they're more engaged than any of us ever were. So um, we've, we've got to take for of their caps. They're the, they're the future. We've destroyed it for them. So they're the saviors. But we've got to climb on the bandwagon and help them with the knowledge and the experience that we have of running our businesses and see how we can apply that. Every business today needs to start giving back. Um, and I think we're starting to realize that. So we've got to do our, our bit. We've got to do our bit as, as corporates to, to support the, the, the changes to what is going to happen to us. It's inevitable. I mean, it's a disaster. We've annihilated so many species and they just, it just keeps, keeps coming. So, yeah, I don't, I don't have the solution to this. I mean, we're doing our piece in a very small way in terms of bringing people to wild places and hopefully educating them and edutaining them, as I said earlier. Yeah. Um, but that's not going to solve it. Uh, you know, those are the people that, that, those are the folk that can afford to come to our camps. Um, we, we've got to, we've got to uh, catch a wake up seriously. And, and, and governments need to start actually telling us how to do things. You know, we all listen to, to government when they say recycle and we all step in line. And I think COVID's been one of the most interesting ones because when the government told us to stay at home, we all listened. So if the government, and I know it became, it became very dictatorial to a point where we all said, geez, this is actually, but yeah. maybe with COVID taught us that 
if government can guide us and, and, and we are forced to listen because there'll be penalties if we don't, mm. that's the way that government mm. actually need to deal with this because we listen to, to the rules and we stick to the rules. Those rules need to be in place. Mm. That's just my, my opinion. Sure. Interestingly, um, I mean, we don't have time to go into some of the areas that I'd love to talk to you about. In, mm. in fact, I think you've got another 10 podcasts in the next 10 days. <laughs> Amazing, uh, the, the insight and the experience that you have. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, about the, the, um, the COVID-19 uh, mm. and, and the pandemic. Obviously, you, my guess is that you have many staff delivering those experiences for the clients all comes through the ability to help those clients have that experience and staff are critical to that. Mm. You're worldwide in this country. We're very acutely aware of the issues that most businesses are facing. Hospitality, more mm. than any business. How have you seen that pandemic make it worse? And have you come out the other side of that? Yeah, I mean, the, the pandemic for us and our staff was, um, you know, it was, it was the worst thing that could ever have happened to a small business like us you know it was just a perfect storm and f for everybody in this game uh, you know suddenly uh, your revenue streams were just cut dry there was nothing i mean our little boutique hotel in chelsea um the draycott uh, you know we were closed for 18 months and uh, it's a leasehold property with um, with cadogan estate you know it's a you've got obligations and everything else that comes with it and then of course it was it was even more of a perfect storm because we had Brexit, so you had this uh, ma mass exit of a lot of our staff were Polish. A, a mass exit; they didn't know what was happening post Brexit, and so they fled. and And po Poland was kind of on the up, so it was yep. quite a good time for them to leave. Yeah. I think that combined with COVID made it this the mess that we were in. So um, I spoke to my GM yesterday, and I said, "How's the recruitment coming along?" You know, he he said he he started to see things turn for the first time. Uh, a month or two ago, but he said it's actually not. You know, we, we get lots of applications, and uh, a lot of people just don't even rock up for for interviews. Um, and I and I think that's because probably we we're a small bit too tell so we can only, we have a sort of threshold in terms of what we can afford as staff. And you've got all the big players that are um, uh, swooping up because they're so desperate. So the little guys are struggling along. So it, 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 it's a long road to recovery, I have to say. Um, but yes, you, you talk about our, our, our staff in Africa, for instance, and how they would have been inf impacted because you know they a lot of them are breadwinners. Yeah, sure. You know they're supporting ten people back yeah, home, yeah. and they've got a pretty menial job with us. Sure. Some of them, and uh, they that that was that was awful for them. Um, also, when you're running a game reserve, you can't just turn off the lights and say goodbye. You've got to protect the animals, so you've got an anti poaching unit. You've electrified a, a huge fence, which needs you need to keep the electricity on. Or the, yeah. the, the lions will break out and go and eat 50 sheep next door. Far easier to catch in a springback. <laughs> um, you've got, uh, you know, just the maintenance of the lodge, which needs upkeep like any building does. Um, so, you know, it didn't, didn't stop for us. We had to keep funding all of those things. But then your staff, we had to leave, let all the staff go. So where we were very, very fortunate was... Um, about four years ago, we sold half of Mantis to a French hotel group called Accor. Okay. And we were very fortunate that, it, that we did that because um, it was quite a, a large business, isn't it? Yeah. Quite a large yeah. If they the, I believe, the second or the third largest hotel group in the world. Wow. Yeah. So you've got uh, Marriott and then I think Accor and then, uh, you know, the rest. Um, sure. And uh, so we were really fortunate. Dad's timing again, you know, is impeccable. He, he managed to sell a big business before a pandemic, which is pretty, <laughs> <laughs> pretty smart, or pretty damn yeah, lucky. Timing. Yeah. And um, of course, that gave us uh, a big brother that was able to help us through the dark times of COVID. And they had um, a fund called the Hartest Fund. And so if, if you had staff um, that were desperate, like we did many in Africa, we, they would give us a check to help feed those families and just keep them ticking along in that. So thank God for that. We were very lucky. Um, and, and have we turned a corner? Yes, we're back. We're back. We survived. Thank God we survived this. And we are now firing on all cylinders. We've got an interesting pipeline I mentioned to you in, in the Middle East, uh, you know, UAE, Bahrain, Saudis. Saudi is such an interesting place. 
lot of people frown upon it. You know, there, there are issues. Um, I say to those people, South Africa had issues, remember that. And if we didn't give Nelson Mandela a chance, Monday, where would yeah. we be today as yeah. a country? So I think we've got to, we've got to give that country a chance. The, the ruler is trying to change things. Uh, you can imagine there are a lot of super conservative families there. Sure. And you've got to respect them. And he's the one trying to, a youngster, he's 35, 36, yeah. trying to change those people. It's not going to be easy. Um, this morning, they're talking about bringing, um, uh, allowing you to buy alcohol at duty free at the airport. That news just broke recently, and I read about it this morning again, um, which will you know help them transform tourism because they want to get tourism right there. Sure. And of course, us Westerners like to have a drink in the evening. We like to have sundowners. So that's the starting point. Sure. Um, things are changing for women there, which are very positive. So, so Mantis is pretty proud to be associated with a country that's transforming because we went through it once before. And, um, and, and it's exciting times for us. So um, we're feeling bullish. It's gone like within seconds. <laughs> uh, if I've, Half an hour has just flown. Thank Is you. there anything that you've not mentioned that you, you thought, oh, I wish I'd have talked about this bit? Have you covered yeah. lots of stuff that you I wanted think, to cover? I think there's a lot for your listeners yes. to digest there. Yes. And, and I think um, I think they probably ask me to shut up. <laughs> I but I'd love to come back. I'm sure there's more things. I'd love to get my dad in here uh, oh. when he's next over because wow. he'll tell you a lot more than what I'll tell you. He'll go into the more the more detail. He'll go into a lot more of the business uh, 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 trials and tribulations, uh, which I think is really what your listeners would be fascinated by because he's been on that rodeo several times in his life. That would be amazing. If it, and yeah. we'd love that to happen. And we'll work yeah, hard we'll work to make that happen. Good. Um, Thank you so much, Paul, for Come coming in. in today. It's been it's fascinating and I, and I can't wait to actually have a pint in the pub with you and talk about <laughs> other things. But Thank you for having me, Michael. I really appreciate it. I, uh, thanks to your listeners. Our, our pleasure and our listeners and, and viewers will, uh, will absolutely echo what I say. Another amazing podcast this afternoon and I'm just going to go away and take my breath. And Until next time.